Good morning, church. It is good to be with you this morning. It is the 1st of August. I can hardly imagine. There are parts of me that's like the summer has just started and parts of me that are like, oh no, it's Christmas. What do I do? So, <laughs> so a blessing on all of us this day as we try to figure out this weird in-between season and look forward to what's coming next. Uh, if you are joining us online, I want to give a special welcome and thank you for being with us to share this time of worship together. As we uh, come into this time this morning, we have just a few announcements, uh, and it always makes me giggle. Lauren is so good about texting me every week. Do you have new announcements? Do you have new announcements? And nine times out of ten, I go, no, no, there's nothing. And then on Sunday morning, I start spewing things, and she's like, thank you. I asked you for new announcements. Uh, and I'm about to do that right now. Um, so just some reminders. Uh, as we are watching numbers rise with COVID-19 and the D variant, uh, we just want to encourage you to do what you need to do to feel healthy and safe. So if you want to wear your mask, by all means, wear your mask. Uh, when you greet and talk to each other, um, please respect each other's distance and boundaries. And uh, just to be sure that you are aware of being grace-filled and how we all just sort of figure out how to take these next steps. And we're just going to pray very hard that it stops. Because I know none of us are in a place to just really function that way anymore. <laughs> I think just special prayers for our teachers and our students who are looking at going back to school and all of these new complications. So just peace and grace and patience from and to each other, and we will all be okay. Uh, coming up in August and September, we are doing our annual shoe bank uh, drive and pledge. There will be ways for you to give. Uh, if you read the newsletter, you know that uh, we are hoping to be able to give $5,000 worth of shoes in the fall, which is already primarily funded, and then again in the spring. Uh, very unusual to the way many of these uh, ministries work. Our shoe bank is solely funded by the contributions of its people. We don't have any special grants. We don't have any special sponsors. And though that might be something we have in the future, for now it's just us. And this community always responds in great generosity. So I thank you in advance for how you will be responding to that and making sure that we are loving uh, the children in our community the best that we can. On August 13th, uh, that is the second Friday. We will attempt our movie in the prayer garden. But what I have learned is that I have vast power over the weather. And anytime I schedule anything in the prayer garden, it rains. So um, if you have a special need, consider calling me. We'll talk about a donation. Uh, <laughs> Just playing. It's just been so hilarious to be, you know, we're going to do this, and then it rains. Okay, we'll reschedule, and then it rains. I didn't know I had that much control. Uh, as we move forward into this year, we'll talk about it uh, more during the sermon. We are approaching a new season and a new uh, teaching focus. It is going to be much more than a sermon series, and it's rooted out of the book called The Art of Neighboring. Uh, this is not a new book. It has been around a long time. But the more I have prayed and asked for the Lord's wisdom and insight about how we as a church come into this new season, how we help drive a new season instead of always feeling like we are in the responding end, that as the church we're called to drive culture, not just react and respond to culture, that part of being a healthy church, part of being a healthy, thriving community is how we help those around us be a healthy, thriving community. And so that will be uh, just sort of a focus for us. Um, this church is very in tune with wanting to meet the needs uh, of its community with the food pantry and the shoe bank and our Wesley ministries and all of the things that happen. But we need to know our neighbors. Uh, we have a beautiful gift being rooted in a neighborhood. And if anything uh, has if being a part of Project Transformation and working with their interns this summer has uh, reminded me of anything, it's how important it is for a community to have an anchor. And our church can be that anchor for these neighborhoods uh, with grace and forgiveness and justice and mercy and compassion and hospitality. And so I ask that you would just continue to pray on that. Um, those books can be purchased online at Amazon. I have a few copies in the office. And if you subscribe to Kindle Unlimited on Amazon, you can read it for free. Because, um, you know, I have to have the book thing. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> so uh, these are just ways to participate, press in. Uh, if you are interested and you are willing to commit to really turning and pressing into this season of the art of neighboring, I will make sure that you get a copy. Uh, but it's part of how we are going to create a new normal. And by creating a new normal, we sort of return to what an Acts 2 church likes and how we looks like and how we become the anchor in our community. So I invite you to pray that with me and to pray that for us as we sort of press into this season. Uh, with that, um, if you are joining us online, I invite you now to uh, start passing the peace in that thread. This is more than just good morning or hey, how are you, but a blessing from one to another and the peace and grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, if you are here in person, I would invite you to check in on your smartphone and engage that thread, but to also just turn quickly and wave, smile, blow kisses, whatever works for you today. Um, Community is important. Oh, and I almost forgot. So Omar is home. Omar and Jennifer. Um, we had a beautiful time with Carlos. He did an amazing job. We love having him here. I hope we will get to see him more. Uh, but it's always good when family comes home. And so welcome home, Jennifer and Omar. Don't leave me again. And, <laughs> and with that, let's turn our thoughts and our affections to the Lord as we prepare our hearts for worship. Please stand for the call to worship. Respond with the people's portion written in bold. Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love. Because of your great compassion, blot out the, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. Restore to me the, joy, to me of, the joy of, of your, your salvation. salvation. And, and make, make me, me willing, willing to, to obey you. you. Then I will teach your ways to rebels, and, and they, they will return to you. Res okay. Okay. Forgive me, me for shedding blood, O God, God who saves. Then I will joyfully sing of your forgiveness. Unseal my lips, O Lord, that my mouth may praise you. And now, uh, join us in this hymn. Remain standing. <laughs> Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, 
Join me in the Confession of Faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day, he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. Listen now for the word of the Lord. After this, Jesus crossed over to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Sea of Tiberias. A huge crowd kept following him wherever he went because they saw his miraculous signs. He healed the sick. Then Jesus climbed a hill and sat down with his disciples around him. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. And Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? He was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. Philip replied, even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that with this huge crowd? Tell everyone to sit down, Jesus said. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered about 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves and gave thanks to God and distributed them to the people. Afterward, he did the same with the fish, and they all ate as much as they wanted. After everyone was full, Jesus told his disciples, Now gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they picked up the pieces and filled the twelve baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. When I read this scripture, and particularly this time, I find I have so many questions. There was not nearly enough information in this for me today, especially as we talk about community and what it looks like to go forth. And, and I wrestle with all the various commentaries that bring different presentations of the text. And the first one is, um, for all of us Western-minded, Greek-minded people who need a cause and effect sort of reality, we have to sort of rationalize the mysterious work of God. And so they talk about, well, he didn't really feed a minimum of 5,000 because it's 5,000 plus the women and children 
with five barley loaves and two fish. What it is is an example of everyone giving what they had, and so everyone was fed, and then and you fill in the blanks. And so they, they want to sort of rationalize the mysterious power of God. But it's hard for me to get there, one, because the scripture says these people were fed from the five barley loaves. It's very clear. It doesn't say they were fed from the five barley loaves as given an example. And do you know what I mean? Because 5,000 people sharing everything they have so that total strangers could be fed is a miracle. That would be recorded. I feel very confident. So not enough information there for me right there. And then I start thinking about, well, how did that work? Like after he's consecrated and he's prayed and he blessed these fish and these loaves, how did they distribute? Like in my head to sort of keep the mystery alive or to not try to get too much into like the science of what it looked like to see bread mysteriously appear. I've imagined this basket with a lid. And so it's like Elijah and the never ending flower. So you just open the lid and poof, there's a loaf of bread because I don't want to have to think about what it does or doesn't look like to see the miraculous in action. But I think the place where I really get hung up, and for the first time ever, get hung up in the scripture today, is the little boy with the five loaves of bread and the two fish, and how in this text, he doesn't say a word. We don't even know how Andrew knows that this boy has five loaves of bread and two fish, We don't know if the little boy came up and offered it and said, here, I have this. Or if he said, hey, I've eaten my fill of what I brought and here's what's left. That would have been me. Or (laughs) here, you can have my leftovers. Uh, Or did Andrew see it and just take it, imminent domain of the feeding? What? What was going on? Was he happy to give it up? Was he angry? Was he afraid because he's a kid and he's like, what am I going to do? Tell the rabbi that he can't have the fish and the bread? What is the, con- what is the context? What's happening? And why does he need my five loaves and two fishes when there are a minimum of 5,000 people here? Why didn't they think to bring their own? <laughs> I also happen to love that Jesus looks at his disciples and says, where are we going to buy bread? Like there's a stop and go in the corner or like a gas, a gas station or a Whataburger like right down the hill or something. Hmm. I feel like money is the big problem here, that having enough money to find the bread is really the issue. There is no bread to be had. There are no easy answers for the text. It has to sit in that tension of grace and truth and the miraculous and believing that God does what God says he's going to do. That Jesus looks at these people and his first response isn't, I hope they thought to bring dinner. His first response isn't, oh, I'm hungry. How are we going to get through them so that I can be fed? He doesn't sit and eat what they probably brought for Jesus. If they grabbed those loaves of bread and those fish from that little boy, it was probably to take care of Jesus, the rabbi not the 5,000. But Jesus' heart was to his people. And they didn't even know he was there. They were his people yet. They were people coming to look to, to sort of examine the miracles. It doesn't say that they were faithful. It says they were curious about the miraculous things he'd been doing. They wanted to get a look at him. They wanted to see for themselves We don't have any understanding of their place of faith or belief or expectation. Just that they wanted to see, wanted to show up for the show. So here we have five barley loaves, two fish, what people estimate close to 12,000 people sitting on a hill. I want to know how they distributed the, the bread, not just like opening the lid and like how that happened, but if we're going to talk about feeding close to 12,000 people, like did they start with some empty baskets? <laughs> like one has the actual fishes and loaves in it, the others are empty, see? Like the placebo effect, we're going to walk down various sides of this hill and see who actually gets fed. Or maybe they each had a loaf of bread, and, and they're very specific in the scripture that they first they gave the bread, and then they gave the fish. So everyone had had been distributed bread before they started to distribute fish. Why is that important? I mean, I'm asking a real question. 
I don't know, but it is. Why, why is it important that we give what we have and trust that God will make it enough? See, it was interesting when Jesus says, where are we going to go buy bread? And the disciples' response is, we could work for months and there wouldn't be money to buy enough bread. They were focused on buying enough. Buying, not providing, buying. So it wasn't about just how they provided, but that somehow there was other influence in that. They were only talking about enough. Enough. Just to meet the minimum. Just so everyone gets something. Just so everyone isn't grumpy and hangry. Like, just enough. Just enough. If at the end of this scripture, we'd read that they finished distributing and everything was consumed, there was nothing left, there was just enough, we'd still be pretty amazed. We would never think that we should anticipate more. Sometimes enough is all we have set our eyes on. But what we see is that Jesus says, gather what is left. There is abundance. They finished with so much more than what they started with. The miracle, the miracle of enough simply isn't enough. The miracle of enough means that we think God is just going to take us right to the edge and leave us there. We forget that God's provision is about abundance. It's about more than we can dream or imagine or think to ask for. These people that gathered on the hill, they wanted to hear a teaching. They hoped maybe they might be healed or figure something out or catch a glimpse of the Messiah. There were all these maybes, these intangibles, these ephemeral moments that are elusive. But what they received was a tangible expression of God's abundance. They ate till they were full and had left over. It's, a, it's an interesting parallel from the instructions given uh, when they would gather manna from the desert. Gather only what you need for today. Only have what you need for today. Only eat what you need for today. Anything extra is going to become rancid and rotten. It won't last for another day. But in this presentation, in this space of who Jesus is and how God moves through Jesus, it isn't about just enough. It is more than enough. More than enough of God's grace, provision, the very physical, real needs that we get distracted by. God has more than enough. More than enough. Twelve baskets more. What they began with was something that wouldn't even fill a basket. And out of this consecrating, this blessing, this manifesting, this truth, God's abundance became very real. And it wasn't dependent upon whether or not the disciples believed there was going to be more food, whether Jesus was going to be able to do it. Jesus just did it. He didn't say, this depends on your faith. If you believe enough, there'll be plenty. If you hold true, there'll be plenty. Jesus just pours out in graciousness and provides. The people on the hillside don't have to believe that there's going to be food. People are just coming to them and bringing it to them. They don't have to hope, wait, or pray. It is being provided. Jesus looks at these people from the hillside and he has already declared them his own. How are we going to feed them? How are we going to take care of them? They're ours now. They came to the hillside. They came to hear. They came to be taught. They came to gawk. They came to speculate. But now they're ours. And how are we going to take care of them? I am quite certain those minimum 5,000 people weren't looking at the disciples and Jesus saying, ah, I am now a believer. They were there to investigate. They were there to experience. 
And they were met with love and hospitality. Feeding is a, uh, I consider it one of my spiritual gifts. <laughs> I like to feed people. I want you to be so full it hurts. And often, if it's the first time I've cooked for you or brought food for you, I give you the caveat, if you don't like it, I'll order you a pizza. Because even if you don't like it, I'm still going to feed you. I will make sure that you are satisfied. But it isn't just about the food. It's about the conversation and being together and sharing that over a table. And, and that is actually the real picture of communion. Today, we're coming into a space where we're going to share from the holy table. And I'm not quite sure how this became the representation of the Passover meal and the anticipation of the wedding feast because communion was always about sharing a meal, sitting at the table together for long periods of time. Not, I got a quick 20-minute meal break and then I got to get back to the world. But here is where I'm going to sit and relax and share and ask questions, be engaged, be intimate, I'm going to take my time. I'm going to savor every moment, not just every bite. And so as Jesus provides food on this hill, the expectation isn't that they're just going to eat what little they have and then get back to whatever or head back home, but that they sat and they've been given more than enough so that they can actually share a meal together. And I'm not talking about bread and fish where we are nourished by the very presence and community of communion. It is more than enough. As we start to think about what we reimagine church to be, how we reimagine who we are in our community, what it looks like to um, respond, I'm, I'm going to be very careful and very deliberate I hope you will never hear the words from me, get back to normal. We cannot go back. We can only go forward. And if we're honest, going back isn't really as lovely as we remember. But what is in front of us may be the most beautiful thing we've ever experienced. The opportunity to reimagine who we are as a church. The opportunity to let go of bad habits that are just isolation and what we do in this moment. I was thinking back to a time in my own ministry and life and discipleship where I spent crazy amounts of time at church, not because it was my job or because it was my, like the ministry where I taught, but it was where my people were. I could find community. I'd always have somebody to talk to. We were doing something either for the church, for the neighborhood. If I was lonely, if I was sad, if I was just in a funk, I could head up to the church and there would be somebody there, even if it was whatever. The day school, playing out on the playground, although in these days you can't just wander up to the day school playground. They frown on that. That uh, <laughs> um, I could go and hang out with the youth pastor. I could go hang out with the office staff. Or I could go hang out on the playground. Or I could go hang out in the women's... Like, there was always something some evening, some whatever. And it wasn't about me figuring out a way to squeeze, one in more, one, squeeze in one more church activity because the church was really my home. It wasn't me being grumpy about having to come do something that took me away from the things I really wanted to do. It's because what I really wanted to do and who I wanted to be with were there. It was an anchor in my life and in our neighborhood and in the community. And in the darkest spaces of my life, losing my mom and my dad, that place, those people, that faith, the people who had faith for me when I didn't have any of my own, they gave me life. They fed me. Literally and physically, you know, physically or emotionally, spiritually. I mean, we're Methodists. We meet, we eat. There was always something to nourish my spirit encourage my heart. It was my joy to be there. It was my desire to be there. I wasn't worried about what I couldn't do because I was going to be at church that day. Because that was my heart. What does it look like for us to find a way to return to some of that? To believe that, to be that. For who we are isn't just enough. I don't get just enough church. 
I don't get just enough of the sermon. I don't get just enough communion. I don't get just enough prayer. But I live in the full abundance of a whole identity of an abundant God who says, do you see those 5,000 people? Do you see those four neighborhoods that way and three neighborhoods that way and some of those people across the street? What are we going to do? How are we going to give them bread? How are we going to take care of them? How are we going to learn their names, know them, invite them in, not because we need something from them, but because we have something beautiful to give them. and We want them to share at our table. Will you pray with me? Lord God, we love you and we bless you and we thank you that you are more than enough and that your miracle is more than enough. That it is about the abundance of your heart, of your provision, of your grace, your compassion. God, would you teach us to be people of open hands? That we receive in abundance and we give with abundance. Where we trust you to provide all that we need so that we don't have to hold tightly to the things that we already have. God, whatever it is in my life, in our lives, that represent those five barley loaves and those two fish, and whatever space we find ourselves as that little boy, whether we brought them willingly, we've taken what we wanted from it and brought you the leftovers, whether you just take it because we don't know how to be generous with you yet, God, we come and say, this is, this is what we have, but it's what you gave us, and so you do with it what you will. And we walk among the people sitting on the hill, bringing what little we have. Would you teach us to ask for names and to make relationships and to invite people into our families and our lives? That it isn't a project, it isn't a plan or a program, but it is a commitment to be people of relationship. First, a relationship with you. And a relationship with you that is healthy and alive and vibrant, and it overfills us to the point that we know that it is the greatest gift we have to give to another person. Would you remind us that we really do have good news? And sometimes before people can hear good news, they need to be fed. Sometimes before people can be transformed by words, they have to be transformed by our actions. I thank you that you already have a community here that loves with hospitality. Would you grow our roots deeper in that? Would you inspire us to move in that? Would you make room in our heart for that? We love you and we bless you, and it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you, I want to see you, to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. 
Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, 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 you are holy, 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 I want to see you, holy, holy, to see you. Holy, 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 you are holy, holy, holy. We cry holy, 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 I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up Shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, 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 we cry holy, holy, holy. I want to see you. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. We cry holy, holy, holy. I want to see you. God, we make that our prayer, that you would open our eyes, that we would see you in each other, that we would see you in the world around us. We would have eyes that really see, that we would glorify you in all that we have and all that we are and all that we do, the way we love each other, the way we love people we don't even know yet, the way we love our enemies. God, would you open our eyes that we might see who you have called us to be, to see the opportunity, the possibility, the beauty. 
God, I pray that we don't just look for the easy out or the easy answer, that we don't put on rose-colored glasses that makes the difficult piece go away, but that we really see. And so when we see beauty, it isn't because we've ignored the broken spaces, it's because we've seen what redemption looks like. God, by your grace, by your spirit, by your power, give us real vision. And beyond being able to see, God, give us a spirit that moves, a spirit that responds, a spirit that obeys, a spirit that cries out for others. A spirit that sees need and moves in the compassion of Jesus Christ to respond. That we would back our prayers with action. God, make us doers of the word. And when we see God, would you translate that into our heart? That we don't see strangers or enemies or problems or obstacles. What we see are your children, our brothers and sisters, your opportunities for grace and for growth, for hope and restoration. That we don't minimize emotional wound, but we step in with strength to bring healing. Had that we love you by loving and serving others. God, we bring to you those in our community who need to experience your hand. For Tom and Trish, Norma and Luis, Bob, Marilyn, Ryan, Maya, Yoko, Gina, Marilyn, Jason, Mary Beth, Renita, Sandy, Don and Donna, Gary, Judy, Edna, Terry, Mary, Dwayne, HJ, Kim, Jeanette, Pam, Ed, Jan, Tom, Eloy, Angie, the family of Lori Ruiz, the family of Margaret Crown, the family of Norma Alonzo, the family of Juan Farias, the family of Jean Houts, the family of Jose Valdez, the family of Hazel Carson, the family of David Thrasher. Lord God, for those in our community who need your healing hand, for those who are struggling with diseases and difficult diagnoses, where treatment is almost as painful as the disease itself, God. We ask for your healing. We ask for compassion. For those in our community who are struggling with resources, Lord God, we ask that you would release the storehouses of heaven. Teach your children to give all that we have so that none would have need. For our teachers and our students and our families, our medical professionals, our elected officials, 
God, as a nation, as a global community, as we struggle to deal with COVID-19, the aftermath, the emerging, the re-emerging, God, would you lift all fear? Would you put in its place the assurance that you are good and you are for our good and you will show us the way? For those who are suffering with a depression and anxiety, mental illness, spiritual illness, God, we ask that you would deliver them, that you would put the people in their path that can bring them to health and wholeness, that they would get the care and the treatment that they need and deserve. For a country that sits in unrest. God, I ask that you pour out your peace, that we would turn our eyes to our neighbors. And if we can't figure out how to love our neighbor, we would embrace how to love our enemy. God, would you be so fully present in our mind, in our thought, in our spirit, that we would be reminded that you promise more than enough and that we do not need to hesitate to ask. We don't have to hesitate to be transparent in our need or our doubt and our frustration that you are more than enough for all of those places inside us. I'd invite you to, if you are joining us on the thread or in person, to submit your prayer requests. You can do it with the Menti site. If you are here in person, you are welcome to call them out loud. But we, as God's brothers and sisters, sons and daughters, we are called to bear one another's burdens, to lift one another in prayer. It is both our responsibility and our privilege. And so, God, we bring before you the things that are on our heart. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, hear our prayers. Lord God, prayers for those who are experiencing and have been diagnosed with COVID-19. Healing for those with COVID. Health of family and friends. Prayers for a daughter starting a new job. God, for these things and the, and the things that we don't know how to give voice to, that we, we don't know how to explain or express, God, we invite you in. We thank you for your tender, loving care, your faithfulness, your kindness. And we give ourselves to you in the sure and certain knowledge that you are already moving on your people's part you are already bringing healing, that you are already restoring, that you are already making things right. And in the midst of it all, you are with us and give us peace. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. And now as disciples of Jesus, we pray as Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is the time in our worship where we respond by giving our gifts, our tithes, our offerings. I invite you to do that. Uh, we have drop boxes in the back. You can continue to give via the webpage or the Facebook. You can drop them off in the drop box. There are lots of ways to give. And giving is part of our biblical witness. We cannot surrender that. But we don't just give of our finances. We give of our time and our talent and our giving and our service and our testimony and our witness. And so I ask that in this space, you would ask the Lord how you can bring a sacrifice of praise. Who needs to hear your testimony of how good God is or how God has provided? Who needs to be forgiven? Who do you need to seek forgiveness from? But in this space, help us to give more, to give all of who we are to the Lord our God who gives all to us. from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise for the Son and all Lord, take these gifts, bless them, multiply them, do with them infinitely more than we could dream or imagine for the good of your kingdom and the glory of your name. In Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As we come into this time of celebrating at the table, of sharing in communion, um, just a reminder that we have, we will offer bread and individual cups, but if you would prefer prepackaged communion, we have that as well. If you are joining us via the live stream, you are welcome to gather your elements, and I will extend the table in consecration. We are one body bound together by Christ's Holy Spirit, and we share that table regardless of distance or location. We are here because Jesus has called us, strangers and friends, locals and visitors, believers and doubters, the certain and the curious, it is always a mixed company that Jesus gathers and invites to his table, where in the bread and the cup he meets us. And through him we are different, are joined to each other. So come, not because you understand, but because you are understood. Come, not because of how you feel, but because God has food for you. Come, not because you deserve a place but because Jesus invites you just as you are. We remember on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he was celebrating the Passover meal with his disciples. He took the bread and he blessed God for it. He broke it. He gave it to his disciples and he said, take this, all of you, and eat. This is my body given for you. When you do this, remember me. Then Jesus took the cup, the last cup of the Passover meal, the cup of salvation, the cup of the new covenant, and again, he blessed God for it. He gave it to his disciples and he said, take this, all of you, and drink. This is my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. When you drink this, remember me. And so, Lord God, we remember, by your mercy, by your grace, by your death and resurrection, we are called to be your people. We love you. We cling to you. We thank you that you are more than enough. 
Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and gathered by your Spirit on these gifts of bread and cup and make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we might be the hands and feet of Christ in a hurting world that needs to know that you are good, that you are real, and that you love. It's in the name of Christ Jesus that we pray. Amen. I'd invite those who are, com- who are helping serve communion to come forward. We'll ask you to come um, in one line down the center. You'll dismiss yourselves. If you would like to receive the prepackaged communion, um, you can come this way. And if you want to receive from the bread and the cup, you can come this way. Uh, and we invite you to come now. The body of Christ broken for you. Body of Christ broken for
Lord God, as we feast at your table, we experience your holy presence. We experience you. God, transform us. Make us a little bit more like you than we were when we came in. Don't let us leave unchanged. We love you and we bless you, and it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. It is good to be back. Good to see everyone's smiling faces or, or masks, <laughs> whichever, the, whichever the situation is. Um, also, we want to uh, welcome back Robbie, who was uh, with his family in Oklahoma over the summer. And so it's great to see Robbie back as well. Would you please stand and join me in singing Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see, t'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved, how pray just did that grace appear the hour I first believed my chains are gone I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. The Lord has promised good to me, His word my hope secure. My shield and portion be as long as life endures. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God and Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood. His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God and Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns unending love amazing grace the earth shall soon dissolve like snow the sun forbear to shine but God, who called me here below, will be forever mine. Will be forever mine. You are forever. Mom. Your 
receive this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord turn his face to you and give you favor. The Lord lift his face to you and give you his shalom, his peace. Amen.